Hi, my name is Moshe Kindler, and I'm the publisher of The Jewish Link. Hi, this is Elizabeth Kratz. I'm editor of The Jewish Link. And you're on The Jewish Link Pitch Meeting Podcast. Our podcast guest today is Rabbi Larry Rothwax. Thank you for being with us. Um, Moshe is in Israel, so it's just me today. But as I was saying to Hannah earlier, who is not on camera, um, our digital editor, that um, I was kind of happy that Moshe wasn't going to be here for that interview because he sees you every week, every day, uh, probably multiple times per day. And I don't really get that Mm -hmm. much FaceTime with you. So it's an honor for me and and a pleasure. And uh, basically, most of the excitement around what's been going on with you over the past several months, the paper, the, the, the Jewish Link community sort of already knows about some of the things that our pitch meeting concept would be about. So like, say, take, we're going to take us, take each other back to two, two or three months ago, when you announced to your community that you would not be staying in Teaneck forever. Um, And basically, why don't you tell our pitch meeting podcast listeners, what happened at that point, and maybe how, how we at the Jewish Link assisted you in telling your story. <laughs> thank you so much for this opportunity. It's really a, a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you for allowing me uh, to partner together with you to continue to sort of share this story, if you will, and, um, and, and have access to your incredible audience. Uh, uh, and, um, among them, I include myself. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, several months ago, uh, my wife and I made an announcement to our shul, and I like the way you said it, that we, we won't be here forever. The truth of the matter is, none of us will be here forever. Our time in this world is limited, and I believe that as Jews living here, as, as hopefully very, very grateful, uh, fortunate, and comfortable uh, residents and citizens of the United States uh, see our time in this country as being one which, which is limited. Uh, I've been saying for years to the members of my shul, um, and I really, really believe it's true that for all of us, it should never be a question of if, rather when. Uh, and for many good reasons, uh, individuals, families, uh, and groups of people sometimes find it very, very difficult to actually schedule when that will be. But just to know, to always keep on on sort of the, uh, not, not necessarily in the back of our mind, in the front of our minds, that this is where we are going to uh, ultimately be one day, I think is very important as we continue to establish ourselves and continue to grow our roots here in this country. So, but uh, be, but I would say also before we get to the plan and what the plan is, which is pretty complex and I think detailed for someone who's who's like so in like ensconced and settled in a community as a community rabbi. Could you take us back even further a little bit and share a little bit about what you? Where, how long you've been at Congregation Beth Aaron, uh, what you do at YU, where you come from, a little bit about that. Like, I, I, sure. we're just going back further. Okay. We're reviewing what, what was already in the paper, I think, before we talk about the next article. Sure, I think. absolutely. Yeah. So I was actually uh, born uh, in, in New York, and I spent the first 10 years of my life in Far Rockaway, New York. Okay. Uh, I consider that to be the place where it all started. So when people ask me, where did I grow up? Uh, I always answer, answer for Akwe because I think, like many of us, you know, the earliest, most formative years of our life are, in many ways, the ones that had the greatest influence on us, certainly on a foundational level. That's where I, I lived for, like I said, the first 10 years. When I was 10 years old, we moved to Fairlawn, New Jersey, which is right around the corner here in Bergen County. Uh, and that's where I lived uh, until I got married. I met my wife in Fairlawn, who obviously grew up in Fairlawn as well. I say obviously because uh, my wife is a daughter of Rabbi and Mrs. Yudin, who are among the uh, the pioneers of the Bergen County Orthodox community, uh, but the founding Rabbi and Rabbitson of Congregation Shomei Torah in Fairlawn, which was uh, officially established, I believe, in 1969 when they when they came. Uh, I. Uh, after finishing Smich at YU, I became the assistant rabbi in congregation Abbas Achim B'nai Jacob and David. I'm so impressed with myself that I could still remember how to say it. It's that uh, A-A-B-J-A-B-J, A-A-B-J in D- right, okay. In West Orange. In West Orange, right. I was there for uh, a little more than two years. Really, really wonderful experience for us here, uh, there in West Orange. And then we came to Teaneck, and we've been here now for 21 years. This is uh, the end of our 21st year, and it's been an incredible experience. Uh, my wife and I, our entire family, 
feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity not just to serve this community, but to be served by this community. This community has been a wonderful place to live and to raise our children. And we've been, you know, the fortunate beneficiaries of many good connections and friendships uh, and, and the like. Um, as you mentioned, I also have the good fortune of serving as the director of professional rabbinics at REITS, uh, which basically means that in the smicha uh, department, if you will, of, of Yeshiva University, in which we train um, and educate the future rabbis of the Jewish people, uh, I have the, really it's a privilege to oversee the department of practical rabbinics, professional rabbinics, in which we train our students in uh, all of the aspects of the job that are not, I would say, sort of directly connected to that which you would find in Shulchan Aruch. So it goes without saying that any smicha program is going to include a very heavy uh, focus on the study of Torah in general and halacha in particular. Uh, professional rabbinics includes everything from public speaking to pastoral counseling to practical aspects of officiating at certain life cycle events, uh, studying and exploring contemporary issues in the rabbinate, uh, engaging in, in in very, uh, I would say, sort of, sort of deep conversations about who we are as individuals, coming to understand our own, um, ourselves, our strengths, our weaknesses, to develop a sense of self-awareness and to, uh, to hopefully uh, enrich and enhance our uh, emotional uh, tapestry so that we can go ahead and interact with people in a way that is helpful to them, uh, at, at, at all times. So that I, I, you know, that, that's sort of what I do at Yeshiva. I've been fortunate to be in that position for seven years, and I, I find it to be very enriching personally and professionally. And you also have a background, I think, in it with the social work aspect, which has also, I think, aided the work at REITs as well. Yeah, in, I like to in think so. In a lot so. of ways, right? I, I went back to school about five years ago to, uh, to get a degree in social work, and now have the opportunity to serve as a licensed social worker as well, which is something that I have very limited time for, understandably, uh, but something I'm passionate about personally, and as you pointed out, uh, intersects very naturally uh, with a lot of the other work I do. Although, and it's not a conversation for now, uh, there are some very there are some very clear uh, overlapping similarities between uh, rabbinic counseling and mental health counseling but there are some very significant differences as well. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the uh, challenges I've had, but I think it's been an enjoyable challenge, is to try to carefully navigate my way, you know, through that, that course and make sure that at any given point in time, I know if the rabbi is speaking or if the social worker is speaking. Right. Not, not always That's the same a, That really does seem like a, like a concept for another whole podcast. Yeah. Because it, and I did hear you speak even last year, I think it was at the women's, the OU Women's Initiative Conference, mm -hmm. when you spoke to a lot of female social workers, a lot of whom were also Rebbitsons. Mm -hmm. And I, maybe a, I think it might have been the Rebbitson, one of the Rebbitson conferences Maybe not. Yeah, correct. No, I think you're talking not. about the Rebison's conference, which probably also had a lot of mental health professionals right. there as well. And we we spoke about related topics. That is right. correct. And there was actually a, a lecture that I don't know if you were at before or after it, which was fascinating about um, the concept of serving as a witness in legal proceedings and whether or not these kinds of, like a Rebison is necessarily protected under these sorts of legal laws at sort of like a rabbinic or like a lawyer client privilege relationship that is fascinating. and there was mm -hmm. there was actually a case i forgot when it was but it was in like washington state and it was a colel and they they told they went through the whole history of it it was very interesting but so so there are basically there's carryover between social work and rabbinic work but there's also like sometimes legal responsibilities in terms of reporting or not reporting and it was very interesting i just remember mm -hmm. and you also talked uh, to you were you gave a lot of chizuk to the audience i specifically remember about the concept of um serving a community being a communal um leader and servant but also the fatigue that can come along yeah, with that I'm and that that felt very real and it felt like the like i feel like you smacked the audience over the head almost with like this realization that like oh my gosh this is okay this feeling i have sometimes has a name 
It's yeah. called compassion fatigue. Yeah, that's what wow. it's called. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. This was almost uh, a year ago. I had the opportunity to uh, deliver a couple of lectures at that conference, and one of them was on compassion fatigue, which is uh, something that uh, it is it is spoken about routinely in the mental health community, but not as much, mm-hmm. uh, at least until now, right. within the rabbinic community, and by extension, as you said, this was a conference for Rebitzins. Uh, and yeah, it is very validating uh, to be yeah. able to know that what I'm feeling has a name. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, uh, if I remember correctly, you know, we did try to talk very specifically and concretely about knowing how to set limits and knowing yes. what your limits are, and knowing that uh, whenever you say yes to someone uh, or something, you're, you're saying, saying no, no to something else, uh, and yeah. vice versa. And that that's really, really, really important. Um, I know that in the just reflecting back, and I'm, I'm definitely not at the point in this conversation or in my tenure here in TNEC where. I'm sort of reflecting back, feeling as if I'm, I'm, I've, I've got a foot out the door because I don't feel that way. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm very, very much here at the moment and happy to be here and proud to be here and feel like we have more work to do. But I can definitely tell you as a reflection that in the first, I would say, five to ten years mm-hmm. of our time in the shul, we were, we were supercharged. We had what felt like at the time, and in retrospect, I remember being just almost like endless energy. Mm-hmm. And there were people who... Uh, who were benefiting from that and who were observing us from close up and from afar who were saying, be careful, mm-hmm. you know, slow down, right. don't, don't burn out. And, and thankfully, we didn't, we didn't burn out, mm-hmm. but we did, we did ultimately have to slow down. And that wasn't necessarily a, a choice which was conscious driven. It was just, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we're, we're, we're both older than we once were and we have more responsibilities within our family and beyond than we once did. And you do reach a point where you say, okay, you know, I I have to really take a step back and think about this more strategically. How Mm -hmm. am I going to spend my time? Because uh, there's really, there's an unlimited amount of of needs that we could potentially occupy with ourselves at at, at any given point in time. Right. Okay. So why don't we move into how did this idea of you potentially making Aliyah to a new community yet to be built? How did it come about? And I mean, I know Pete, we read a little bit about it in the paper, which was here. I'll show that to the camera. You read the about it in the paper that in you, March in the article 2nd. that you wrote. In That's the article, really amazing. I, I reviewed How often it again do you read recently. your own articles? I, I reviewed it again today, but uh, we, we, we wrote it in March 2nd. Mm. And I was like, Hannah, where's March 2nd? Mm. And uh, we were able to find it. Here we it, are, almost and, two months later. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so the way I would, I, you know, and again, I, I also appreciated very much the, the coverage. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for, sure. your, for the, the generous um, article that, that you had written at the time. I, I would say that this came about uh, very slowly and organically and then somewhat suddenly and unexpectedly. Oh. Uh, that's, uh, a, that's a lot of, that's like a lot of adjectives. Yeah, <laughs> Slowly, okay. organically, so like, then suddenly, and what? And unexpectedly. Okay. <laughs> so you don't have to write this down. I it's like being it recorded. though. Okay. You're so right. I, you're right. Okay. That's, you, so I, I would say like I'm this. a reporter still. Sorry. <laughs> so th- this is, actually, I just realized that this is the first conversation we're ever having that I'm not, I can't ask you, is this on the record? Because Oh, yeah, it's totally on the record. The, well, we the can first. delete things okay. <laughs> if necessary. Okay. Um, I will say this because I don't want to forget to say it later. And I don't know if you remember this, Elizabeth, but the, the, I think the first time you reached out to me, which probably within the first year of the link, I was at the time very hesitant uh, to speak to you, not personally, but as a reporter, mm-hmm. because at that point in my career, um, I was still very wary, as I remain, and, and when it comes to certain issues and certain reporters, to have conversations, not know exactly whether or not my words are going to be uh, reported um, with, with the context and the nuance in which I tried to share my thoughts. And it took me a little time, not much, to become comfortable with the link in general, and Elizabeth, you are very generous reporting in particular, but I think that you've been very faithful in that regard, and I'm sure it's not just me, I'm sure that anybody that you've ever spoken to probably feels the same way, which is very much appreciated because it is sort of a shutfuss. There's a partnership between individuals in the community, leaders in the community, and um, a media organization such as yourselves. And uh, we have to work together. And if we feel that you know we can speak to you openly without having to say, is this on the record? But know right. that if you have any questions, if there's anything about what, what's being said that is not clear and requires any clarification, you'll come back to... Right. To seek that. And That's very much th- appreciated. Thank you. And I think it, what's interesting also is that because you are the personal rabbi of my publisher, 
like he in some ways he can't report on <laughs> your life or what you're doing oh. so it's sort of like like if he were to do it he i mean he would it would be a completely different situation yeah and it would be so, like me getting up in the shul and giving a drush about Moshe Kindler. I couldn't do right. that. And he, well, I, I, I'm sure you have before and will again. <laughs> right. But, but, it, but it, it, it's, it's true that we did need someone else to write the stories that involve you in some cases. And also that, that um, as the editor of this paper, you've, you have had a unique impact on this community that maybe someone in your home shul might not uh, be able to see because they're very close They're, you know, and I'm, you know, I mean, I'm not so far away. I'm literally across the street from your brother, truly. But um, on the, in the, in very real terms, I'm not in the Beth Aaron world. Mm -hmm. So like, I've been there for, you know, Kinderler or Simchas, basically, or like a Lamdenu event or two, but not, you know, not, I'm not inside the Beth Aaron community in the same way. And so it's interesting for me to be able to report on the rabbinic activities outside my own my own home turf though i have to say rabbi sabloski and rabbi newberger also like they like when i report on their activities but it's I'm different sure. it's different because then i have i feel like this ownership like oh my god right like gotta, better get this right yeah i have to get it right definitely okay. but anyway uh, so back to what happened two or two to three months ago yeah Yes, as I was saying, I think that the the decision to move at this time is something that has grown um, organically over time because we have always uh, thought about, as I said before, not if but when. Mm -hmm. We never knew when that time would be. And I think for my wife and I, perhaps we were waiting uh, for that, which in retrospect, even though the call, uh, if you will, sort of came, I I'm not sure that it that we had any right to expect that it would. You know, sometimes in life you just sort of need to take initiative and you can't necessarily wait for that very, very direct call. But we were hoping that there would be a time where it would sort of be clear to us as to, okay, now is that point in time. Uh, we have had the good fortune, and I believe this was reported in your article, uh, to see 20% of the members of our shul make Aliyah uh, since we have been here, which is an, ex an extraordinary number. Uh, we recently put up this beautiful um, display in our shul, uh, which we sort of honor uh, the names of all those individuals who made Aliyah. And it's, it's a long list with hundreds of names. It's really, really breathtaking when you take a look at it. Um, and I won't say everyone came back at some point to say, hey, we miss you. We miss Beth, we miss Beth Aaron. We would love so much of what we had here in Teaneck, there in whatever the case may be. But enough did that we would always think about, you know, maybe at the right time we would be able to transition and continue to do some of what we do here, albeit in a different, in a completely different place and space and, and culturally in a, in a completely different environment and, and setting. Uh, I, I would also add that one thing I felt like I wasn't able to explain when you said that very point to be able, it, because it's not exactly the idea of transplanting yourselves. It's the, it's the opportunity to teach Torah and to con make sort of the continue the work that you guys do, which is, you know, talking about complex halachic topics um, and, you know, discussing topics that are not generally discussed, but in a new place and not necessarily like turning Israel into Teaneck or vice versa like that and it was interesting because some of the feedback on the article from the Israeli side because of course it was like posted the article was posted everywhere online were like we're like you can't turn it's Israel right. like what's you know exactly. we're, so I don't I think that it's it's interesting I think people should know that the idea of a rabbi moving to Israel is not new it i mean it's certainly there's been many aliyah stories of rebbeim over the years especially from prominent communities and i think it would it's it, knowing who you are and the kind of torah you teach is a key part of this story as well so maybe uh, a little bit about that if yeah, you don't mind i, I appreciate it and i agree entirely this is, is absolutely no way whatsoever an attempt to transplant a shul or a community or right. even a type of community as much it is to perhaps uh, meet the needs uh, the very explicit uh, requests of individuals who are there to be able to to develop, you know, some of the I'll call it the the soft infrastructure of a community, meaning the the, the hard infrastructure, the hardware, if you will. So those are the buildings, uh, literally uh, the the structures of a community. Uh, the soft 
infrastructure, the software, if you will, is more of you know everything on a on a social, uh, programmatic, organizational level. How we interact uh, as individuals, as families, and as a community. Uh, I am absolutely not the last, not the first. I'm not the last. Uh, there is, like you said, really nothing unique about this move, other than the fact that it's unique to myself personally. And my wife, this is the first time, and hopefully the last time that we're making Aliyah. But I, I don't, I don't in any way whatsoever presume uh, to, you know, be saying uh, to you or anyone else, you know, join this, join us this once in a lifetime opportunity. You know, there's never been anything like this, and there never will be again. In fact, I have some very, very dear friends and colleagues who have already sort of set the stage in a very, very significant way in the very neighborhood uh, which I hope to join in Ramat Beit Shemesh. So this is not me coming and saying, okay, he, you know, here's how we're going to do it. Watch. Really quite to the contrary. It, it is my understanding, it is my, imp- my impression that there is a, an ever-growing desire and need for more of that because there are Hashem, more people making Aliyah. There are more people who are used to a certain, like I said, a certain way of life in which the shul is at the center of the community. I think that one of the challenges, and I say this at the moment as a spectator, uh, because that's all I am, not as somebody who has actually been playing on the field, if you will, in Israel, is that in the United States, and I think this is probably true of the entire diaspora, uh, a shul uh, functions more than just a place that we come together to daven and learn, but it really is a place in which the community um, it, it, it's, the, it's the focus of this community, it's the center, the nucleus of the community, to allow us to sort of come together and retain a certain identity. Because at the end of the day, while we don't necessarily feel it and experience it as if we are at risk of assimilation in any sort of you know, very limited extreme sense, we are. We are very, very much a minority in this country. And we are constantly uh, surrounded by and bombarded with messages that are completely antithetical to everything that we know and believe um, and, and, and treasure and value as Jews. And so therefore, the shul is one, it's not the only one, but the shul is a structure where individuals and communities can sort of gather around and come together, uh, in some cases several times a day, for other individuals once or twice a week, and in some cases several times a year, but it's a way for us to sort of remind ourselves who we are, what we're about, what are our goals or aspirations, our future, etc. In Israel, and I would say this is a good thing, uh, the need for that is not quite as compelling. After all, you're, you're, you're living in a Jewish state. Uh, there are Jews everywhere. And while there are other, uh, other uh, nations, other faiths, if you will, in Israel as well, but I think that the feeling that, uh, oh no, here I'm in Israel and there's any risk of, of assimilation um, is you know, is, is, is for the most part uh, unfounded. And so therefore the need to have a shul that operates and functions in that well is not something which is in any way whatsoever self-evident. But there are benefits to that sort of communal life that people miss. And my sense is, like I said, many people are looking to sort of recreate that. I had the opportunity a couple months ago to spend Shabbos in Modi'in, uh, in a w- really wonderful community, uh, and I've been there before sh- for Shabbos, and I, I very much appreciated the way in which, I, I, there's no need to mention it, but the particular shul that I had the opportunity to be at for Shabbos and to speak there, to me it did ve- feel very familiar in a sense. It was, the shul did sort of function for the members of that community in some ways, like a like a community center, not just a place that we go to, to Davin. And I think that there's a growing interest in that sort of shul. I, I should mention that many, it, seemed, it was my impression that many of the people in that shul, if not most of them, spoke English. These were, this was an Anglo community, and so therefore, like I said, I, I, I think that, you know, that that's sort of what they're looking for to perpetuate uh, a certain way of life that they were accustomed to back home. I think that the idea of a soft landing uh, into a community where English is spoken is a sort of an, or insert whatever language is someone's home language there it it when you consider the concept of aliyah that idea is very attractive and i know like personally if if i'm looking at communities when i'm in israel i'm looking at who can i connect with immediately like and that there is that the idea of a kahila that might already function a little bit like i know might have the familiarity the you know the the daily activities that i would expect and that's a it's a beautiful idea and i think it probably gives a lot of your congregants and other people from varying various communities who might be considering aliyah like some 
some comfort as they might more seriously now consider Alia. Yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, it's a big adjustment. That there are a lot of changes that are inevitable and that you know sort of comes with the package of Aliyah. But like you said, to the extent that we could sort of uh, create a little more of a, of a of a runway or a landing way, if mm-hmm. you will, so that you know when people come, uh, the landing doesn't have to be quite as as abrupt um, mm-hmm. and traumatic. Uh, I think we are, you know, we are doing uh, the members of our community in the broader sense a great uh, service, a great favor. Nefesh Benefesh, uh, which was founded 20 years ago, oh, look at that, an ad right here oh, yeah. in the paper, oh. was really uh, founded, um, I think, primarily in order to not just promote Aliyah and to facilitate Aliyah, but actually to make it easier, more accessible yeah. to individuals, yeah. to help people work through the bureaucracy and be able to, uh, you know, spend less time you know, working through some of the very unfamiliar places and spaces that that yeah that people and would Rabbi get stuck. Rabbi Fass's idea, who I think he's a member. Of, is he related to someone in your family or your or Fairlawn? Rabbi, for, yeah, correct. He's, he's a Brandstatter. That's or correct. He's, right. Rabbi, okay. Rabbi Fass is married okay. to a bunch of a Brandstatter right, who okay. is originally from Fairlawn. Okay, so not exactly your family, but your extended family. Right. Okay. Yeah. So his idea was in creating Nefesh Benefesh to make some of that like like gobbledygook that that comes at you when you're filling out your forms to have someone there to help you to have someone assist you in getting a job in Absolutely. in seeing what this thing is going to look in like fact, this ad that i'm and looking at right here for medical, of medics. right so i heard from people who were at that event that mm-hmm. apparently there were several hundred people there this took place a couple of months ago that there were many people who just stood on a pretty short line and began the process of transferring their medical right. licenses right then and there. I mean, the point here in Teaneck. And otherwise, this would be something like completely impossible. Where do I go? Difficult. What do I do? Difficult, like, challenging. What, yeah. who, what line do I stand in? Mm-hmm. Who are these people? What What do I want? So right. yeah, so having having some assistance in any of these uh, fields is is very helpful. So why don't you tell us maybe take us take us to Rothstein Heights, I guess, mm-hmm. and what what you maybe what it looks like now in your head and maybe if if that vision has changed at all since we last uh wrote about it yeah. uh, in the last few years and i i would also say to to our readers that this is this is there there's a taste of things to come because a writer in israel is planning to report on this story from the israel side Great. soon in the yeah. next month or i two. wouldn't say that the vision has changed it is evolving uh, as it is designed to, because mm-hmm. uh, th- this was this like every idea. It sort of starts in as an idea and has evolved. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were certain givens that were that were in place from the outset, and I would say if there's any way in which this model is unique, again, I'm, I'm not going to say unprecedented, but I think one way in this which this model is unique is that there is uh, plans for there being an actual physical space for a shul from day one. And that is not typical. Often what happens, uh, and there's a reason why it has to happen this way, is that you need to have people on the ground first. Um, and then when you have, uh, let's just say, 100 families, for argument's sake, there, they can then apply to the area uh, for land, which would then be you know, designated for a shul. And then you know, a process would follow a fundraising construction, which could take several years, if not more. What makes this different is that Rothstein Heights is a project which will include uh, 1,300 resident residential units, uh, commercial space, uh, you know, parks and other, you know, areas, and the various amenities that you would hope to find in any family-oriented community. Uh, the builders, Rustin, which is, the, you know, a major construction company in Israel, which is, uh, you know, which is overseeing this entire project, has uh, agreed, but when I say agreed, that they've really, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was an idea uh, that came uh, through a conversation, and there was mutual interest in this type of arrangement, they agreed that it would be in their best interest, that it would be appropriate and something that they would like to do to allocate a commercial space for use for the community, uh, for a place to daven and learn, we'll just call it to be used as a shul, for however long that is necessary, until the time that people are on the ground and areas that have since been dead, but designated but can ultimately go through the proper props process of building a proper shul will um, will be able to move into that space so whereas uh, what, what 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 often happens is my understanding is groups of people will move to Israel not necessarily together uh, they'll find themselves uh, living in a, in a in a particular area and they'll need a place to daven 
So it may be your backyard, it may be, uh, you know, his driveway. Uh, sometimes it may be, you know, in the in a back room of a post office. I don't, I don't know. We try to make the best of the space that we have, and it creates a lot of, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you, at least in the short term, uh, there's, there's something very, you know, hefker about that. It is what it is. It's not such a terrible thing. But what's nice about this is to be able to form a community that will exist, at, at least in concept, namely you have people who have committed to live together in a certain place uh, at a certain time before day one. And from day one, there will be a place that we can come together and begin already our communal life. And even if that space will not necessarily be the permanent, if you will, location, it will be there for however long needed, uh, you know, in all likelihood, several years, if not more. So that that's an exciting feature of this concept of this project. Uh, the community, as I mentioned, is going to be large enough to um, to occupy, I, I'm just trying to think how many, sh- I, don't, I don't want to put a number, but how many shuls in theory uh, would be needed right. in order so to meet the needs of the community. Right, so 1,300 You're talking about tens 13. of shuls ultimately. Right. So yeah. the shul that I hope to be a part of, uh, the community that we have named Marome Shemesh, mm-hmm. which is, again, sort of, a, it's a little confusing for some people. Wait, what's it called? Rostin Heights, Marome Shemesh, which one is it? So Rostin Heights is the, is, is the project uh, in this community, which is immediately adjacent to Ramat Shiloh. So for those who are familiar mm-hmm, with Ramat mm-hmm. Shemesh, uh, that's where it is. Actually, the mountain itself has been named by the area Ramatayim. I don't know how many people actually know that yet, but if, okay. I think if you look at Google Maps, you'll actually see it already. It's official, Ramatayim. Um, Rostin Heights is a project on that mountain, Ramatayim, and Merome Shemesh will be one, I imagine, of several, maybe even many communities, but Ezra Hashem, wow. you know, as part of this this complex. So it's exciting uh, because, you know, there's really, there's tremendous potential here. What's the what's the highway that runs between the, the, the Ramat Shilo and the the Ramat that you just mentioned? Well, there's no real highway that runs between them. The closest highway is, is, is 38, okay. which is, you know, which is sort of the artery that connects Beit Shemesh and Ramat Beit Shemesh. Right. So this community uh, would be, it's, it's actually, uh, in, it, it, it's geographically in between Ramat Shilo and 38, it's, but it's much closer to Ramat Shilo. It's sort of okay. a, a, okay. a, a stone's throw, if you will. I know that probably poor taste when talking about uh, uh, locations in Israel. But anyway, <laughs> right. uh, uh, it, it's, it's that close. Okay. And then 38 is just, uh, it's probably, you know, a half a mile, you know, down the road, right. so to speak. Okay, so I, I'm pretty sure I was there the last time I was in Israel because I got lost a couple of times trying yeah. to find. I was visiting Gavaot Winery, uh-huh. which is on in Givat Harel, uh-huh. which is like, I think also right there. And there was also a, f- a farm, a working farm called Shilo something or other, where they had blueberries and raspberries even in the winter. Uh-huh. My kids were, lo- were loved that. And it was sort of a working farm with bees and things like that where they gave tours. And so that there's, there's some like activity there. And then there's like apartment complexes before that and after that but there's just this huge expansive area that yeah. i think is there's, where you're uh, I, if if that's if this is the area that we're talking about i hope i'm not wrong and then we don't have to it could be, cut I, out all of this from the yeah. from the um article, i'm not sure but. i know that this area is already well under development so if you're there if you i mean last time i was there several months ago they were already uh, they already four or five stories built mm-hmm. in several of the buildings. Right. So also it, it, Shilo Winery. So, sorry because I'm making the I, the wine guide annually, and I visited uh-huh. 15 wineries okay. last year. Shilo was not available for me to visit this uh-huh. year, and Ami Khailuri, who's who's my colleague, who is the winemaker there, uh, said I couldn't come because they were literally building their new winery and visitor center. But I saw it as I was driving by. It's like, it was a construction project, but it looked great. Amazing. But I think all this whole area is like very central. It's not. It's what fifteen minutes from your Uh huh. So yeah, it is yeah. a very very central location. Twenty minutes so from and Tel Aviv and Modi, and it's really the the center of the country geographically. Mm-hmm. It's a major population center. I think it's uh, it may be among I don't know the the the, 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 the I, I don't I, I don't want to misstate this, but it is it is growing exponentially, and it is set to be one of the you know, densest population centers in the country, wow. uh, probably within the next five years. So anyway, so Roth, 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 it's, it's Rothstein Heights, right. not Rothstein. Like well, I've been I think, it. no, you're, you're not necessarily mispronouncing it. Okay. People have called it, I mean, I call it Rothstein because that's just, that's the way it looks to me. Okay. But if you look very closely, it is written 
as if it says Rothstein, okay. which is probably the Israeli way of saying Rothstein. I do okay. want to say for the record that this has nothing to do with Roth, Roth wax, wax, because there have people right. who have asked, you know, where, where's yeah. Roth wax sites? And I've been quick to point out there is no plans for Roth wax sites, right. no interest it's in it. It's kind of Thanks a natural joke, though. Yes, I, I get makes it. A lot. I, Moshe Markowitz made it to me. So yeah, yeah, he was I, very... I get it. It's fine. So <laughs> I think if you say Rothstein or Rothstein, okay. uh, you're, you're, you're okay either way. So, so these guys are investing in, first of all, the, sh- the shul. They're the, as mm-hmm. a central location, and they're building. Basically, it's sort of like Field of Dreams. If the if you build it, they will come. And um, I, I love that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's certainly what they're hoping. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is obviously a multi-billion-dollar venture. I mm-hmm. imagine. So they're very much hoping if you build it, they will come. I think that it's fair to say that that is true because if you see uh, the trends of growth and the need for housing in Israel, mm-hmm. uh, it's only going in one direction. Um, you know, I don't know that they can necessarily completely control what this community looks like and who will ultimately live there. But I think what they're hoping for, and one of the reasons why they've decided to invite us, is that they are looking to establish not an ex- exclusively an Anglo community, but you know what they have called a YU type community. There's no oh. there's no official association affiliation with Yeshiva University over here. But I guess what they mean is, you know, again, we're here in Teaneck, New Jersey, so. W- there are there are many different um, ways that we could sort of label ourselves and who we are. I'd rather stay away from labels, more just associations with whether you want to call it Bergen County, Yeshiva University. This they're 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 looking to create a place where many of these people who have already or are in the process of planning to make Aliyah can come together and could develop communities that meet their needs, um, and then over time, as you pointed out, and then connect to. Uh, the or at the same time, I guess I should say, connect to the broader Israeli community uh, okay. to make those those connections, which just allow for, you know, new cultural advances for every for everyone. Of course. So tell me, I guess that maybe the last question or second to last question, what do you, what has the feedback been like so far, and what sort of what are your next steps as you personally make the plans toward Aliyah? When will it actually take place? I know that I know it's not your contract at Beth Aaron is far from complete. And they're not going to let go of you so easily, I don't think. So what? So how is that? How is that going? What's the What's the next step? Right. Okay. So listen, I'm going to start by saying, as I mentioned earlier, and to me this is it's really important that I stay say this and and repeat it from time to time. Right now, you know, we're very much here, uh, and I'm not just saying that because I feel that I need to, because otherwise it seems you know as if I'm being you know, for lack of a better word, maybe uh, unfaithful to my own community. Here I am, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I'm in Teaneck, I'm employed by the shul, and I'm spending all my time building another community. So the answer is no. We're here, we're very much here, we're engaged in the needs of the day, um, and we're here on the ground, quite literally, literally. Uh, that being said, uh, once we announced our plans or expectations, uh, our hope was, and to a certain extent this has materialized, that other people who have been you know, planning at the right time in the right way to make Aliyah and didn't quite know when and where have be, been attracted to this idea and have reached out to us personally or other people who are, who are involved in this project to ask questions and to begin the process of asking themselves, is this right for us? Uh, I will say that the feedback has been, you know, very encouraging. Uh, this is a process. Uh, no one in the right mind is just going to say, hey, Rothwax is moving there. We're in. You know, mm-hmm. where do I sign? Uh, they'd be out of their minds, um, needless to say. I'm sure there have been a few people, though, who um, said that. I will not confirm or deny. <laughs> okay. But the, but it, it, but it's a process, and it's been it's, and it's been great to see mm-hmm. the the interest, um, as well as the excitement from people who, for whatever reason, cannot and will not necessarily be planning to join us mm-hmm. at all or us now. Just to know that there's been that sense of encouragement. I, I will say that from the shul's end, uh, my wife and I um, were very concerned about the initial reaction on the part of the shul because like I said it, it's, a, it's a complicated sort of message but we've been very very reassured and frankly very touched by the by the very fair and generous and positive reception uh, and what I mean to say is that uh, everyone uh, and I, I think I mean this without exception maybe to, to cover myself I'll say almost everyone but I think everyone who has had anything to say to myself or wife has, has really been very positive mm-hmm. uh, not oh so happy to see you go. You know, it couldn't be soon enough. We got a right. few of those as well. <laughs> oh, but, no. but more, you know, we get we get it. We understand mm-hmm. it. And, you know, we're happy for you. Mm-hmm. And we hope to join you one day. You know, things like that. Uh, and that's been very reassuring. Uh, and for the most part, you know, 
life goes on. It's sort of business as usual over here. But I am aware of the fact that as I continue to participate in meetings and conversations like this, uh, there are ads that go around here and there, and every once in a while something gets posted. I just want to be mindful of the fact that, you know, we're, we're still very much here, feel very much connected to this community, and want to continue to be part of, of the immediate future of this community. Um, I can only tell you myself, personally, um, as I see my time in this community coming to an end, uh, again, I don't know exactly what that means in terms of when that will be, but really reflecting not just on what's been accomplished, but more importantly, you know, what, what else you know, can we do? How can we contribute here meaningfully uh, during uh, the next uh, stage of our, um, our tenure here in TNEC? Something that we think about uh, quite a lot. Uh, and I appreciate having you know, these types of conversations because they really uh, they, they stimulate you know, the, 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 this part of my conscience in, in a way that I think is, 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 is very much appreciated by me. Okay, so so your your contract is up in the end of twenty three, twenty four, yeah, um, something like that. Can I have my lawyer present for oh, this? Oh, I don't know. No, so okay, no, no, here, uh, so I'll get Elizabeth, to. Elizabeth, I'm, <laughs> I'm just joking. With you. Yeah, my my contract it ends um, in four years. Oh wow. Uh, Rothstein oh. Heights is you know they, like you know uh, they they're on a certain schedule and they are promoting uh, that they hope to be open for business. Uh, sooner than four years. They're oh, saying wow. in, okay. in the summer of uh, twenty five, two years from now. Okay. Um, we don't know exactly okay. when oh, that wow. time will come because it's really hard for us to know and it's out of our control. Frankly, it's out of anyone's control. And so therefore, what we have said to the shul is that at this point in time, we do not uh, plan on looking to renew our contract okay. in four years. Um, and we will be giving the shul 18 months notice uh, before we plan on leaving, which provides the shul with not just adequate, but maximum time for succession planning. Okay. Uh, the leadership of the shul has been involved in not just the formulation of that statement, but the, the plan, and are very comfortable with it as well, um, and feel that that provides them with a real nice safety net as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is important because you know, we're, you know, we, we're very invested in this community and mm -hmm. the shul, and uh, there's nothing that we want to see more than to see it continue to grow and thrive I'd be mm -hmm. a Sagoa. And you, you have, I know you have had rabbinic interns, but have, has Beth Aaron had assistant uh, rabbinus? We, yeah, we have had rabbinic has. interns. We have a wonderful rabbinic intern right now, Rabbi Ben Sion Feld. Oh, um, right. And we are in conversations with him at the moment about uh, expanding his position. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I'm not quite sure when this conversation will drop, but if it does before that is finalized, well, then that's it. We're <laughs> no turning back. We'll have no choice but to go ahead and close the deal with him. Uh, and hopefully see to it that a new uh, expanded position for him is something that would be beneficial to the shul and would also allow him to continue to uh, grow and develop himself uh, personally and professionally. Lovely. Lovely. Okay, so great. Thanks for being with us. Any any wild and crazy uh, ideas down the line? The the one thing maybe I would say is that you could you, if you could repeat it for our audience if this is if this is still true. And uh, but the idea that you ended with um, that we ended the article with uh, last time was about how and you you alluded to it a little bit uh, here. But in America, it's about protecting our Yiddishkeit. And in Israel, it's about sort of growing toward, moving outward, growing toward the future. Yeah. Going, you know, going toward the, the you know, the next days, the days of Mashiach, the yeah. rebuilding. Um, so I, it, do you, like, can you I'll, end with a rabbinic thought on these sure, kinds of things? Sure. The, the thought that you are alluding to, right. which, um, which I haven't shared um, in, in, in this venue, it was, it was recorded before him put in writing, and so therefore it was easier to, maybe in some ways, to define and limit, is an idea that I heard in the name of Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman, the president of Yeshiva University. I did not hear this from him directly, and so um, I hope I am in no way whatsoever misquoting him, but an idea that I thought was, was very powerful, and that is that uh, in the United States, and again, uh, this really applies, I would imagine, to the entire diaspora, we are very much in, in preservation survival mode. Right. Now, to be clear, here in Teaneck, uh, we don't we don't walk around the streets feeling as if you know we we have to protect ourselves in that way, but more broadly, when you think about it, that is really what we are doing. We are here in foreign lands. Uh, no one, I imagine, sees the eternal future of the Jewish people here in the United States. So we know that we are here for a limited period of time. 
we have and we will continue to sort of establish ourselves to the extent that we believe and see that we should. But we have to be very mindful of the fact that we are here temporarily and our work over here is, like I said, it's more about preserving what we have. Uh, I don't want to say surviving, just getting by the, spin of, by the skin of our teeth, hopefully thriving as well, but always with an eye towards Israel. When we come to the modern state of Israel, which we believe and hope in some way, shape, or form, or all of the above, is the beginning of tzmichat gulatenu, the beginning of the redemption, so then we are no longer operating in preservation mode. You know, we are really working towards the development of the infrastructure of our future. On a certain level, we have arrived. Now again, we still daven each and every day for the restoration of judges in the Sanhedrin and for the rebuilding of the city of Yushalayim and for the coming of the Mashiach. There is still so much that is yet to be done. So much is incomplete. True. But at the same time, we, we feel when we are on the ground there that we are part of something that is so much bigger and, and, and permanent, like this feeling that, that we, arri- we have arrived, we are here. You know, what do we do, need to do in order to establish ourselves permanently for the rest of time? Is a, is a, it's a very, very different mindset. I believe that's the idea that you're alluding to, one that when I heard it, um, I found to be very inspiring, very chilling. And as I share it with you right now, like I said, to the best of my ability, reconstituting an idea uh, that I heard uh, really, really resonates uh, very deeply and and is exciting uh, just personally to think about just being able to sort of shift gears a little bit and um, go from, you know, from one lane in the highway uh, to another. Very exciting. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us, Rabbi Rothwax. Uh, I hope maybe someday we will uh, be speaking in Ramat Beit Shemesh Olive, okay. maybe developing the Jewish link office in, be of Ramat Beit Shemesh. I may come um, to you looking for a job. You never <laughs> know. So thank you very much. Uh, but thank you for your time today and all the best. Really thank you. It. Thank you. Thanks for being with us on the Jewish Link Pitch Meeting Podcast. If you would like to participate or be in touch with us in any way, please email us at editor at jewishlink.news and follow us and find our podcast wherever you find podcasts. 